Good morning, Southside. May we abide in that beautiful truth. We stand forgiven at the cross. This morning we have a, a guest speaker who is going to be with us. Um, his name is Randy Murphy. He's no relate. He's not related to me, and I was so excited to have him. But this morning he broke the news that he's not Irish. So, uh, but we, we are fellow brothers that battle controlling circumstances and seeking the grace of God to be transformed and changed. So we've found more um, bond in that than being Irish. So praise God. And so he is um, the director of what's called CTO. It's a call to obedience and it's a discipleship program that um, Laura and I have just went through and some other uh, families and couples in the church and we're introducing that to Southside, and so he was in town, and um, we were blessed be, to have him come open the Word of God. And so as you prepare your hearts to hear the Word, he's going to be opening up on biblical forgiveness, and so this will be a, a beautiful topic for us to sit in the presence of God and His Word and let Him uh, work deeply in our hearts. So I'm going to ask Randy if he would come and bring us the Word of God, brother. My I. It uh, truly is my privilege to be here with you guys today. And what I just said there really is very significant because I can walk in here and have a, a common bond with you just because of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, we have so many things in common just because of Jesus Christ. And so it really is um, my joy to be here with you and uh, to take you to the Word. Let's, let's pray a minute before we dig into the Word. Can you join me in prayer? God, we come before you because of who you are. God, we bow before you because you're God, and we're not, which is why we so desperately need you. And God, as we look into your Word today, we pray that we wouldn't get lost in the words of your Word, but that we'd be drawn to the Jesus of your word. Open our hearts and our minds to the things you want to teach us. Give us the grace to deal with that. And God, may you receive great honor and glory because of all that we say and do today. And we pray that in your name. Amen. There are two things that will eat you from the inside out. Guilt and bitterness. And both of those, once they take root in your life, they serve like a cancer and just begin to eat you alive from the inside out. Now here's the beauty of the gospel. The gospel addresses both of those. We don't have to live with guilt because of what Christ did on the cross for us. And we don't have to live with bitterness because we understand that we've been forgiven. So these two things that can control People can control our culture, can control your relationships, don't have to. And there's incredible freedom in the gospel from those. Today, we're going to look at one of those, bitterness, and we're going to talk about that. But, but here's the thing I want you to see right ahead of time. Just to deal with guilt and bitterness, just so that I don't have to deal with it, is really not what God wants. That could be therapeutic in just what I get out of it. There's a much bigger thing going on behind biblical forgiveness than just what I get out of it. And we're called to this, so it's not just something I do for what I get, it's how I honor God in obedience to Him. So we've got to start, though, before we even talk about forgiveness between us, we've got to start by looking at God's forgiveness of us. Because that's the basis of all the rest of our forgiveness. And, and we desperately need God's forgiveness. Listen to Ephesians 2. 1 through 3, it says this. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Okay, stop right there. We're dead. Dead. Not like 
our friend Billy Crystal in Princess Bride would say, you're mostly dead. We're dead. What does a dead man need? Life. Can a dead man give himself life? Okay, we're, we got a problem here. Paul goes on to say in verse 3, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We're dead and we're children of wrath. Boy, that's an encouraging way to start a sermon, isn't it? That's our condition. That's why we desperately need God's forgiveness. You see, we're guilty. We're guilty. Uh, listen to Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We're guilty. Romans 1, 18. That's we're separated by God. You, you need me to be forwarding these, or are, are we up on the screen? Ah, there we go. Pilot error. Okay, we are in desperate need of God's forgiveness. Why? Because we're guilty. I think you're going to have to run this morning. This isn't working, okay? We are guilty. I'm on slide six. Not only are we guilty, we're separated from God. Listen to Ephesians 2.12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We're separated, alienated, and without hope. Now, there's a lot of things you can live without, but try living without hope for a while. Boy, that's hard. We're separated from God. We're also totally depraved from birth. Behold, the psalmist says, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, <clears throat> we're born sinners, and that's hard for us to really grab onto. When my daughter, she's now 28, when she was about four, she came walking out of our master bathroom. And she had this stuff from her mother's makeup just smeared all over her face. I think it was called foundation. I don't know. Gals, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Well, she had taken this stuff, and she just all over her face, and she had her ears completely filled with it. So I walk in, and I look at Lynn, and I go, Lynn, have you been in your mother's makeup? And her answer was... No. All right, so I give her another shot at it, right? Just, Lynn, have you been in mommy's makeup bag? And her answer was? No. no. And I thought, now where did she learn that? Did her older brother teach that? No, I don't think he taught her that. He didn't teach her to lie. Well, it must be genetic then. And it had to come from my wife's side of the family, not my side of the family. <laughs> See, we're born depraved. That's our condition. That's why we so need God's forgiveness. And see, God's forgiveness is adequate because of what Christ did for us. I was just watching and looking as we were singing our songs. I want to talk about a few theological terms here. And the interesting thing is every term I'm going to share with you, almost every one of those, we sung about this morning. The first word I want to give you is the word atonement. Atonement, that means to cover up or conceal, to atone for it, to take, take care of. John 1.29, we see the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That sin's got to be dealt with somehow. And our sins have been atoned for, covered, taken care of. The next word is propitiation. Now, I like this word <clears throat> because I just like to say it. You know, it's kind of fun. Propitiation. We sang about this this morning in two songs, sang about this. Propitiation means this. The wrath of God is satisfied. 
Because God is a holy and righteous judge, he can't look on sin, he can't be a part of sin, and because of that, his wrath is going to be poured out on sin. But what Christ did on the cross for us is he satisfied God's wrath. Propitiation. 1 John 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, hello, that's us, right? If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for also for the sins of the whole world. The wrath of God is satisfied. God, God would pour his wrath on us that we deserve, but instead he poured it on Christ, and what he did, and what Christ did on the cross, paid the price that was necessary, and it appeased the wrath of God, so we don't experience that wrath. The work on Christ on the cross on our behalf also provided justification for us. To be declared, to be declared innocent. Boy, this is hard for me because I don't live like I'm innocent. As a matter of fact, I still sin. And, but he looks at me as if I don't. That doesn't make sense. I'm declared righteous. But he doesn't leave it there. Part of the work of Christ on the cross was to redeem us, and that's to set us free. That word redemption, setting the captives free. To redeem us. We don't use that word much anymore. Okay, how many of you remember green stamps? Okay, you just all dated yourself as very old. We used to go to the grocery store and buy groceries, and so for every so many dollars of stuff you got, you got these green stamps, right? And you take those green stamps, you'd lick them, and you put them on this, this page, and when the whole page got full, you could take it to the grocery store, and you could redeem something with that. I remember I turned in one, I got five loaves of bread with my green stamps. I would redeem them. That's what they talked about. We don't talk about that much. But this word redemption is to set free something and you get it back. God didn't stop there. Through Christ on the cross, he also provide reconciliation for us. That's mending what is broken, to reconcile, to take a broken arm and mend it back and get it back to where it needs to be. God shows his love for us, we read, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. More... Then that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Now look at what the result of this is. Psalm 103, I just love this passage. We're going to see something that's really high here in Psalm 103. We're going to see this result of God's love for us. See, as high, it says, as As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As high as the heavens are above the earth. But then we read on in the next verse. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. See, we desperately needed God's forgiveness and look at what he did through Christ on the cross on our behalf. And, and I love this, this, as far as the east is from the west. You notice he didn't say as far as the north is from the south? See, there's such a thing as a north pole, right? And a south pole. So if I'm traveling up to the north pole, what happens when I get to the north pole and I keep going? Now what direction am I heading? South. When I get to the south pole and I keep going, now what direction am I heading? Okay, north and south poles, you can measure the exact distance of however many miles that is between the north and the south pole. I'm going east. What happens as I go east? I keep going. I keep going, and I'm always going east. What happens if I go west? See, God, in his great wisdom, said if he's going to give an illustration of how far he's removed our sins... He gave us an illustration that shows it's immeasurable. You cannot measure how far God has removed our sins. It 
Now we start here because there is a connection between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiving of others. And I've got to understand this. Because if I don't see my need of grace, I won't see my need of showing anybody else grace either. So there's this connection. Let me take you to um, the Lord's Prayer. I'll show you one of these connections. We read along, going through the Lord's Prayer. Father who art in heaven, da 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 da, da right? We get to verse 12. And forgive us our debts as what? Help me out here. As what? We have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's usually where we stop with the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? We don't go on to verse 14. So Jesus goes along teaching them to pray, and we get to the end of the Lord's Prayer, and he goes, wait a minute, i got to back up here, because there's a point I need to make. And he makes that point in verse 14. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Four different times in the New Testament, God's forgiveness of us is connected to our forgiving others. And I want to pack that a little bit for us this morning to try to understand that. Because I'm convinced, you guys, this whole thing of forgiveness is lost today in the church. We just don't talk about it. And when we do, we don't know how to, to do it. I'll, I'll travel around and I'll ask pastors. I didn't ask your pastor this, so you're off the hook, okay? I'm letting you off the hook this morning. I'll ask pastors this question. Are we supposed to forgive the people who hurt us and sin against us? Answer, yes. My next question is, how do you do that? And here's the answer I most typically get. Well, you just forgive. No, that's what you're supposed to do. How do you do that? And it's just not being taught today. We want to dig into that a little bit. And I want to do that by taking you to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> As you turn your Bibles to Matthew 18, let me kind of give you a running start because we're going to jump into the middle of this, this chapter. At the beginning of, of chapter 18, the disciples who still don't get it are um, there arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So now Jesus is going to teach them a little bit about his kingdom. Matter of fact, if you follow Jesus through all of his earthly ministry, he talked and taught about the kingdom over and over and over and over and over. It was one of the central themes of everything he taught about was his kingdom. So he says, okay, they said, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And at the beginning, he says, you know, you got to be like this little child and he puts a child in front of him and says, this child is both humble and dependent. And that's what it requires to be in my kingdom. And that's who's the greatest, is the humble and dependent little child. And then he goes on, as he's talking more about his kingdom, he says, now, <clears throat> you know, I, I am concerned about the humble and the dependent. And there's those that are going to tempt them to, to go in another direction. Woe to that person who tempts them. And then he talks about, in my kingdom, it's more like this. If there's a shepherd and he has 100 sheep and one of them runs off, he leaves the 99 behind and goes and chases the one because of his love for the individual. That's what my kingdom's about. And, and that lost sheep, that one that's running away, is probably running away in sin. So what do you do now when somebody sins against you in my kingdom? Here's how you respond. You go to them and you seek to restore that. And this is where we typically get our church discipline. You know, when you think of Matthew 18, that's usually the passage you think about. But that's in the middle of this whole thing of describing the kingdom and God's heart to people in the kingdom. So we read all about what do we do when our brother sins against me. Okay, now we're going to jump into verse 21. This is our text for this morning. Verse 21, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So Peter's sitting there listening to all this. Okay, here's where your kingdom's like. This happens. Somebody sins. This is what you do. You know, okay. His question was a legitimate question because he's thinking, if I do this and then I've won my brother back, but then he does it again and I got to do this again and then I won my brother back and how many times do I have to do that? And, and Peter says, there how many times? Up to seven times? 
Now, Peter's question here was not really a question because Peter was schooled in rabbinic law. And Peter knew that rabbinic law only required that you forgive someone for the same offense three times. It's kind of like three strikes and you're out, right? So really, Peter is saying this. Okay, how many times do I forgive my brother? You certainly couldn't expect me to give him double plus one what the rabbinic law would require. That would be ludicrous. And look at how Jesus answered. He says, uh, I do not say up to seven times, but 77 times. Some of your translations may say 70 times seven. Okay, so let's take that one. That's 490 times, right? We actually had a guy walk in one day in a very troubled marriage, and he brought a stack of papers in this thick, and he goes, I have written out the 490 times and things I have forgiven my wife for. There it is. I don't need to forgive her one more thing. I think he kind of missed the point, don't you? What's he saying here? As many times as you need to. That's how often you forgive. But for the same thing? Yes, for the same thing. We're to forgive others just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Does God ever have to forgive you for the same thing? More than once? Aren't you glad he's not counting up to 490? So the point is, we forgive. He says you forgive as much as you need to. So now he's going to really drive his point home, and he's going to give them a parable about the kingdom. Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Okay? So let's look at our characters here in this parable. We have a king, and he's going to settle accounts with his servant. Okay? So when he began to settle, one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I've tried to figure out how much 10,000 talents would actually, you know, be. And I've looked at all kinds of commentaries and everything, and, and we don't know if it was silver talents, it might be one amount. If it's gold talents, it might be another. A lot landed on somewhere around $30 million. I just read an article this week where he believes if you added inflation and everything else, it would be $7 billion. That's a lot of money. We do know this, 10,000 was one of the biggest amounts that they knew about, and a talent was one of the biggest uh, values of money they had. So when they heard 10,000 talents, all they knew is this is buku bucks. It's like you telling me our national debt as of today, because I just checked, our national debt of today is $33.1 trillion. Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot get my head around $33 trillion. I just don't have a compartment in my head that can really understand just how much money that is. That's what happened to the people that heard this from Jesus when they heard 10,000 talents. They just couldn't wrap their head around how much that was. So you get the idea? This guy owes buku bucks that he can't pay back. So what happens? And since he could not pay his master, he ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment be made. All right, now that's not cruel and unusual punishment. That was standard operating procedure in that culture. Like today, when you get a house and you go to the bank and you get a mortgage and you sign all the papers, you agree to pay so much on that mortgage. What happens when you don't pay it? Eventually, you're going to get kicked out of the house and you're going to change the locks. Good, because that's our standard operating procedure, isn't it? This was the standard operating procedure in that culture when you didn't pay a debt. So the king is not being crude here or cruel, or he's just following standard operating procedure. So what's the servant do? Verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees. Now listen to this carefully. The servant fell on his knees and implored him, saying this, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. Okay, what did the servant ask for here? Mercy. Did he ask for forgiveness? He didn't even ask really for mercy. You know what he asked for? 
Give me more time. I just need, need some more. If you'll give me more time, then I'm going to pay this back. Well, was that really realistic? No, it wasn't at all. But look at how the king, the master, responded. Verse 27, And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. If you underline, underline that verse because that's the, one of the best biblical definitions you're going to get of forgiveness. It was motivated out of pity and compassion on the king's heart, and he canceled, he forgave it, and canceled the debt paid in full. No late charges, no extra interest charges, paid in full. Wow. Now, if I owed that much money, and who I owed it to forgave me, and canceled all of that debt, you know what I'm doing? I'm throwing a party. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to throw a party. And I'm going to invite all my friends, and we're going to celebrate. Because, wow, what just happened is unbelievable. And I know I didn't deserve that, but wow, we're going to celebrate, right? So what's the servant do? And that servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, 3,200 bucks. 7 billion, 3,200 bucks. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, listen carefully, have patience with me, and I will pay you. Does that sound remotely familiar? It's almost word for word exactly what he had asked for from the king. Have patience with me. I will pay you back. Verse 30, but he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay back the debt. When his fellow servants saw that he had t that had taken place, they were greatly distressed, I guess. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Okay, what's... What's the principle here of the parable? Parables are written not to give us great big doctrinal dissertations, but they're to make a point, and primarily they're always a single point. And you get the point here? It's simply this. The forgiven must forgive. That's the point of the parable. The forgiven must forgive. You see, when I understand that, I look at this, who's the king representing the parable? God, okay, who's the servant represented here in this parable? That'd be us, you and me, right? Who's the other servant? The person or people who have hurt us. See, when I understand I owed a debt I could never pay back ever, and God forgave every penny of that debt I owed him. Every sin I committed, every sin I have committed, every sin I will commit is already forgiven because of what Christ did. He paid the penalty for that in our place on the cross. We're forgiven. Who am I not to forgive somebody else? See, if I think I only have that much sin, how much grace do I need? That much. When I see I have that much sin, how much grace do I need? That much. Here's one of the most amazing truths about the gospel. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad it is, God's grace is bigger than your sin. You cannot out-sin God's grace. That should just make us go, Wow. And just be people of such gratitude. And, and if I've been shown that much grace, I want to show other people the same grace that I've been shown. See, the forgiven must 
forgive. Now, the last verse in this chapter is one of the scariest verses to me in the New Testament. Verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Do you think Jesus takes forgiveness seriously? Do you think God the Father takes forgiveness seriously? And how does this theologically fit? Because this sounds like a very conditional clause. If you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. Here's why I think Jesus said this. See, when I really understand the gospel and how much I've forgiven, why would I not forgive others? So if I refuse to forgive somebody, then one of two things is true. I don't understand the gospel at all, which means I'm unregenerate and not really a follower of Jesus. Or I'm in major rebellion against what God has called me to do. Those are the only two options you've got here. You're either unregenerate or in rebellion. Now, if you're unregenerate, what do you need to do? Repent. If you're in rebellion, what do you need to do? Repent. So this whole parable Jesus is sharing to just bring us to this point to understand the forgiven must forgive. And if I really understand the gospel, it should be a natural part of what I do. I am convinced that forgiving others is one of the greatest demonstrations we have that to show other people and to live out the reality that I understand the gospel. But it's rarely talked about. It's rarely taught and even taught how to do it. So I'm, I'm training a, a pastor, and uh, he, went to, he grew up in a Christian home, went to a Christian school, went to Bible college, went to seminary, and became the vice president of a Christian college. He's now a discipleship pastor, and I walked him through our process of how we help people actually forgive. It's not what we're supposed to do, but how we do it. First plug, tonight we're going to come back and we're going to, we're going to talk about the how-tos. How do you actually do this, okay? So I walk him through our whole process, and the first person he had to forgive, that was hard for him, was his 22-year-old daughter, who is a very outspoken lesbian who hates the church. You think he had a few things to forgive her for? You think their relationship maybe had some tension? But guess what? The forgiven must forgive. So he, he forgave her. And then part of what we have you do is we have people go, and then once you've forgiven this person who's hurt you, we have you go and seek forgiveness of them for how you have responded to them. And God used that to just radically begin to transform their relationship. So for the next five times that he and I were Zooming, every time I hit admit in my Zoom call and his face comes up on the screen, these were the first words out of his mouth for five times. Why have I never been taught this? Why has nobody ever taught me this? You guys, I think it's the number one way as believers we violate the great commandment. Okay, what's the great commandment? Number one, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, right? What's number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm convinced this, one of the major ways we violate loving our neighbor is by our lack of forgiveness. And if you don't forgive that forgive that that lack of forgiveness will start to turn into bitterness. And Hebrews 12, 15 says this, see to it that no one misses the grace of God by allowing a root of bitterness to grow up that causes trouble and defiles many. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. I don't, you don't lose the grace of God. There's nothing that I can do to get the grace of God. There's nothing that I can do to keep the grace of God. And there's nothing that I can do that will cause me to lose the grace of God. Because Christ took care of that on the cross. But I can miss the experience of God's grace in my life. I might not see God's grace in my life. I might not experience, and I think that's what's going on here in Hebrews. You, you miss the experience of God's grace because you've allowed this root of bitterness to grow up. And look what it does. It causes trouble 
and defiles many. You can think, you know what? What this person did is really awful. And you guys, some of you have had people really sin against you in some bad ways. Some of you sitting in this room have had really evil things done to you. But God calls us to forgive. Because he's forgiven us. And what happens is if I fail to forgive, I can't take like this part of my heart right here and say, I'm going to harden this part of my heart toward that person, but the rest of my heart is fine toward everybody else. It causes trouble and defiles many. Lack of forgiveness that turns into bitterness is going to affect every relationship in your life. It's going to affect your relationship to the people around you. It's going to affect your relationship with God. It's going to affect your relationship to you. You can't just harden part of your heart and think everything else is fine. So this thing with forgiveness is a big deal. So God has forgiven my debt. I'm on slide 23. God has forgiven my debt I could never repay. Also then other sins against me are little compared to God's sin against me. And now watch this. This is key. Suppression is Satan's counterfeit for forgiving. So know what a lot of you have done with the sin against you and this hurt that you feel and the pain that, that is there because of other people and legitimate pain because what they did was evil or wrong? You try to suppress it. You try to get it out of sight, out of mind. And if I can get it out of sight, out of mind, then I'm forgiven. No, all you've done is stuck it on the shelf back here. That's trying to suppress it. That's what Satan wants you to do because you really have never forgiven. You haven't canceled the debt that was created. You've just stuck it on the shelf. And now it's going to come off the shelf in one of two times. When you have another encounter with this person and there's new heart, hurt that happens, all of this hurt that's back around the shelf that you think is gone because you're just suppressing it falls off the shelf and lands into this new situation. Okay, those of you that are married... When you're experiencing with your spouse one of those moments of intense fellowship, a fight, think about it. Is usually the thing that happened at the moment where the lid blew off, was that really the issue? Wasn't there all these other issues that kind of led up to that? And that's like the straw that broke the camel's back and boom, okay? See, we stick it back on the shelf, and now when this new event happens and I'm, I'm feeling hurt, it falls off. I lived with a bunch of guys before I got married in Southern California, and there's four of us living together in this house. And, you know, we started getting chips on our shoulder about each other. Well, guys don't talk about that stuff, right? One guy felt nobody takes their turn cleaning the pool. So every time he's out cleaning the pool, and one other guy felt Nobody takes their turn mowing the lawn. So you know what he'd do? Saturday morning at 6 a.m., he'd fire the lawnmower up and mow the lawn. I had an opportunity to meet up with that old friend a few months ago, and I brought that up. And I said, David, remember how on Saturday mornings you'd go out and you'd mow the lawn, you know, just to wake us up? And you'd mow it right under our bedroom window? He started laughing. He goes, I never mowed the lawn. I just started the lawnmower up and let it sit there right under your window. (laughs) That's not forgiveness. Okay? It's going to fall off the shelf. My big thing was nobody's taking their turn with the groceries. So one night, I bought a gallon of milk, stuck it in the refrigerator, went to bed. I got up the next morning to have my ceremonial bowl of cold cereal before I go off to seminary to learn how to be a good pastor. And the whole gallon of milk got drank. I'm livid. Heads are going to roll. This is it. Why was that $3 gallon of milk such a big deal? Because I had all this resentment back here and bitterness that I just tried to get it out of sight, out of mind. And now... 
This gallon of milk is gone. All of that bitterness came out and landed and fell right in that gallon of milk. And heads are going to roll. Suppression is Satan's counterfeit for forgiveness. We've got to really learn how to forgive. See, because my forgiveness, verse 26, shows my understanding of the gospel. So let me give you a definition here of forgiveness. Forgiveness is releasing an offender from my bitterness, wrath, and judgment that they may deserve. Okay, there's two key words in this definition. What do you think the first word is? Help me out. Releasing. Bingo. Underline releasing. What's the second word that I think is important in this? Deserve. Deserve. See, when someone sins against us, they create an obligation. And they create a debt. And you know what What they did? They might really deserve my bitterness, my wrath, and my judgment for what they did. But you know what I'm going to do? Instead of giving them my bitterness, wrath, and judgment that they deserve... I'm going to show them the same grace that God showed me because he doesn't give me his bitterness, wrath, and judgment that I deserve. Do you see how the gospel ties into forgiveness? Those two things are connected. That's why God's forgiveness of us and us forgiving others is so closely tied together. And if I don't understand how much God's forgiven me, I'm not going to think I have any reason or right ever to forgive somebody else. I'm going to feel justified in wanting to be bitter. And and that's our first response. When somebody sins against you and hurts you, your first normal human response is that you want them to hurt just as much as they hurt you. You know how often I want to forgive my wife when she sins against me? I don't ever want to forgive her. I want her to feel the same pain that I'm feeling from her. Guess what? The forgiven must forgive. So let me talk a little bit about what forgiveness is not. See, forgiveness is not based on feelings. I never feel like forgiving my wife. Why do I do it? Just so I can be free from the bitterness? Well, that would be therapeutic. No, you know why I forgive her? Because the forgiven must forgive. And I'm living out the gospel when I forgive her because I'm, I'm reminding myself of how much God has forgiven me, so I need to forgive her. It's not based on feelings. You go, but, but if I don't feel like it, I'll feel like I'm a hypocrite. Okay, let's go down that path. So you're either going to be hypocritical to your feelings or hypocritical to the truth of what God called you to. Pick your hypocrisy. It's not based on feelings. Next, it's not minimizing it or forgetting it. It's not, not saying I'm just going to, that's not that big a deal. No, it was, a, it was a big deal. I love Joseph's, the story of Joseph when he finally um, reveals himself to his brothers and then a few years later, his father dies and his brothers are like, oh man, he's going to get even with us now. So they try to butter him up and everything and, and they're afraid that he's going to just squash him which he had the power and the authority to do. And here's his response. He says, don't be afraid because what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He didn't say, no big deal, guys. It wasn't that big of a deal. It was okay. No, he said, what you meant for evil. He acknowledged that they had evil in their heart and evil intent in what they did to him. He did not minimize what happened to him. Some of you are trying to suppress stuff that's happened to you. And you've got to face up to the reality of what was done was, was evil and bad. And you've got to start there. Suppression is Satan's counterfeit for true forgiveness. It's not based on feelings. It's not minimizing it. It's not ignoring it. It's not placing it on the shelf. We already talked about that. And it's not the same thing as granting forgiveness. Uh, Slide 32. It's not the same thing as granting forgiveness. This gets really confused today, okay? So um, it's not like 
I, I wait to forgive until somebody comes and asks, and, and, and then I forgive them. That, that's, when somebody comes and asks for forgiveness, and I forgive them, and I, I communicate I'm forgiven, that's granting them forgiveness. I maintain forgiveness has already happened before that. Um, it, it's, it's not granting it. It's not, and I'm going to show you a verse in a minute on that. It's not the same thing as reconciling. Just because I'm forgiven somebody doesn't mean we're reconciled. Forgiveness really is an issue between me and God, not even me and this other person. So it's not granting forgiveness. It's not reconciling. It's not the same thing as restoring the relationship. Forgiveness doesn't let the other person off the hook. It doesn't mean that all of the consequences are taken away. I went into years of rebellion. A few years of rebellion. Again, I just said I'm, I'm done with this God and stuff. And I did a lot of things I'm not proud of. And um, God forgave me for those things. But, you know, I, I, I'm convinced my memory is not as good as it could be because of all the weed I used to smoke. Did God forgive me for that? Yeah, do I still have the consequences of that? Yeah. I had a friend that died this last year uh, because of liver problems that were the result of their alcoholism. Did God forgive them for that alcoholism? Yeah, but he still dealt with the consequences of it. Forgiveness doesn't automatically remove consequences. We think, man, if I forgive this person, this is going to let them off the hook. Okay, it's not. Forgiveness requires putting off and putting on. Ephesians 4, 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving another, just as God in Christ has forgave you. So I have to put off this wrath and, and this clamor and this anger and this slander and this bitterness. Instead, I have to put on kindness. So really see what forgiveness is saying this. I want to pursue love. I want good to come to you. I'm going to pursue love. When I forgive you, I'm forgiving you, and I want good to come to you. I'm not going to take this list of stuff I've forgiven you for and throw it in your face and say, hey, I just wanted you to know all of this stuff that I forgave you for. No, forgiveness is between me and God, okay? It's pursuing love for them. It's revoking revenge. It says, I'm not going to do anything that brings harm to you, and I'm going to let God worry about revenge. And it's also longing for restoration. I will do all that's in my power for this relationship to be all that God wants it to be. Now, this forgiveness is unconditional and unilateral. Here's the last verse we're going to look at today. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says this. Whenever you stand praying, forgive anything, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you in your transgressions. There's that if then again. If you forgive, then your Father's going to forgive you. Okay, what kinds of things are we supposed to forgive? According to this verse. Help me out. Anything. I did an extensive study in the Greek language to find out what that included. And I found out it included anything. <laughs> Whom are we supposed to forgive? Anyone. I don't know how awful this sin against you is that this other person's done, but I do know this. It's in the category of anything and that person is in the category of anyone. So it's unconditional and unilateral. It doesn't require that they come to me and ask forgiveness. It doesn't require that they repent of their sin. As a matter of fact, could I be harboring bitterness toward one of my dead parents? Sure. Are they going to come and ask forgiveness? No. Are they ever going to repent? No. Now, what I never noticed in this verse is the activity that you're engaged in when you forgive. Look at the verse again. Can you put that back up there for us? What's the activity that you're engaged in when you forgive here? When you stand praying. You see, forgiveness is really an issue of my heart, and it's an issue between me and God. It's not even an issue between me and the other person. Reconciliation is between me and the other person. Restoring the relationship, which may be needed in order to rebuild trust, that's between me and the other person. But forgiveness is an issue between me and God because it has to do with me and my heart. 
and the forgiven forgive. I want to close with a story. Um, we had a, a gal in her, her 20s who um, we set her up with someone to just start discipling her. And she shared her story with her discipler. When she was 12, her mom and dad got divorced. And uh, shortly after the divorce was final, mom remarried and stepdad moves into the house. Stepdad wasn't in the house long until he started being inappropriate with her. And it went on regularly. She hated his guts. She couldn't wait till the day she turned 18 and could move out of that house. She didn't care if she ever saw that man again. You know, I, I've never had stuff, I've never experienced what she experienced. But I can understand why she felt that way, right? So we walked her through um, forgiving her stepfather. And then she went to him to seek forgiveness for how she had responded to him by hating his guts and by, by withdrawing from him and eliminating him out of her life. And, and this doesn't always happen, but God, God just showed up in the middle of all that. And, and her stepfather said, whoa, 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 stop. This is all bad. This is all wrong. I should be asking your forgiveness. You shouldn't be asking my forgiveness. And God used that moment to melt both of their hearts. And they started restoring a right, healthy relationship over time. And a couple years later, she had to spend a couple days recovering in the hospital from surgery. Her surgery was she had one of her healthy kidneys removed to give to her stepfather who needed a kidney to live. You guys, that's not normal. That's supernatural. How could God give her the ability to forgive like that? That's the power of the gospel. And the forgiven must forgive. How in the world do you forgive that way? Because this is hard forgiveness, you guys. This is hard, hard forgiveness. How do you do that? Come back tonight, and we're going to actually walk you through that process tonight in a special workshop that we have for you. Let's pray. God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. As many times as I've told that story that we ended with, I still get overwhelmed. Forgiveness doesn't seem fair to us. But certainly your forgiveness of us is not fair either. It certainly doesn't seem just. But because you had pity on us and because of your compassion, you, you have forgiven us and you've canceled the debt. And you've justified us. You've, you've, you have redeemed us. You have reconciled us to yourself, God. Overwhelm us with how just significant your forgiveness in our life is, God. And then grant us the grace to forgive others as you've forgiven us, and we pray to that end. Amen.